Beauty of whatever kind in its supreme development invariably excites the sensitive soul to tears. Edgar Allan Poe, January 19th, 1809 to October 7th, 1849. Yes, born today, 214 years ago, and passed over to the other side in October. That's pretty cool, huh? He only lived to be 40 years old. My gosh, he lived a relatively short, unhappy life, but during it, he produced some of the world's most recognizable poetry and stories. Orphaned before the age of two, he became estranged from his foster father in his teens. He became an alcoholic who had difficult, difficult time keeping a job. He married his young cousin, Virginia Clem, who probably inspired much of his fiction and poetry, only to see her sicken and die of tuberculosis in her 20s. His drinking was exacerbated by her death, and only two years later, he himself died in Baltimore, four days after being found wandering the streets, delirious and in clothing other than his own. Um, on a side note, there is uh, some speculation that Mr. Poe was actually a time traveler, but we'll cover that in a future session. It's actually believable. I mean, well, anyway. His first book, Tamerlane and Other Poems, was published anonymously in May of 1827, although his first love was always poetry. Once upon a midnight dreary, he wrote stories, reviews, essays, and commentaries in order to support himself and Virginia. He worked as an editor for several magazines, during which time he garnered the epithet The Hatchet Man for his tough critiques of submitted works. It was during this period that Mr. Poe wrote what many consider the first detective story, The Murders in the Rue Morgue. Both The Pit and the Pendulum and The Telltale Heart were also written while Poe was living in Philadelphia, but it was the publication of his poem, The Raven, in February 1845, that finally brought him the recognition he had long desired. Last year, in honor of Edgar Allan Poe's birthday, we had a week-long multi-reader celebration with over 25 hours of Poe stories presented, all of which is available on the StoryLink Radio YouTube channel for your listening pleasure. <clears throat> to summarize, Poe presents an improbability. His literary genius spanned poetry, short stories, novellas. More than two centuries after his death, his classic tales of Gothic literature continue to inspire new writers, striking a chord in the hearts and imaginations of countless Edgar Allan Poe enthusiasts around the world. Today is the 214th anniversary of Mr. Poe's birthday. And so in memoriam, we gathered tonight to recognize the man and share some new stories, new stories, inspired by four of his greatest works. The Telltale Heart, The Fall of the House of Usher, The Oval Portrait, and of course, a very special and timely version of The Raven. Shannon pauses here so Caledonia can type in The Damned Bird. Well, she'll catch up, I'm sure. I hope you will be intrigued by what tonight's authors have created in these interpretive tributes. There it is. I can confidently say that Poe himself would have been very proud. My first one is called Until the Heart Betrays, based on the telltale heart. Did I say that right? The telltale heart. And, you know, maybe it's just me, and maybe because I like, you know, October Halloween. But this one, and tell me at the end if you think I'm wrong, this one reminds me of Sally and Dr. Finkelstein. That sound, that damned hollow sound of his cane on the hardwood floor. Not that he needs it. He can't walk. But it's his latest way of summoning me to do his bidding. Lillian! This isn't the way things were supposed to be. I love him, or <laughs> I used to. And I thought he loved me. Yes, many people think I married him for his money. That isn't the truth. That's why I didn't mind signing the prenup. My friends thought I was stupid. Why, they said if he loved me, did he think it necessary? Well, I told him that his ex-wife cleaned him out, and he was just trying to protect himself. Maybe that was the truth. <laughs> More likely, I was just fooling myself. We married when I was 36 and he was 81. Some might call me a trophy wife, petite, blonde, with decent breasts. The prenup stipulated that if we were to divorce, I would get 10 million in a lump sum. Now, that sounds like good money, but after years of putting up with his demands and mental abuse, it isn't enough. Yes, I want it all. 
I don't know how much more of this I can take. On some level, I do still love him, but I'm, I'm getting older, and I need time to enjoy all that money. And my breast, well, this body, this face, needs some work, I'll admit, but the cheap bastard will never pay for it. He wouldn't pay for the breast enhancement I asked for a few years ago, saying my C-cup was more than any woman needed. Lillian! Oh, coming, dear. I call out. Patience is not one of his strong suits. But persistence, on the other hand. Over the last few weeks, I've been giving him a daily dose of thallium. But I think the poison just makes the bastard live longer. Tonight, with dinner, I'll get a dose that I'm sure will kill him. Lillian! I'm hungry! I'll get him his damn dinner, then I'll, and I'll break that cane over his bald, wrinkled head. I walk to his study, I stand in the doorway. This is his space, and I'm not to violate it unless invited. He sees me, and he lays the cane across his lap. I hate that cane. Slick ebony wood topped in a silver vulture's head with blue sapphires for eyes. Will you be coming to the dining room, honey? We can have dinner together. It's about damn time. Where the hell have you been, Lillian? Didn't you hear me? I've been calling you for hours. It was only a few minutes. But I guess when you're his age, every minute seems like an hour. I'm sorry, dear. I didn't hear you. He sat in front of his television. At times, I wondered if he could even see the damn thing. But what do I care? As long as it keeps him out of my hair for most of the day, he can watch the television until his eyes fall out. I'll take it here. I don't want to miss my shows. I can't remember the last time we ate dinner, or any meal, together. He takes every meal in his study in front of that damn television. All right, dear, I say. I'll be right back. I knew our private chef had already left for the evening, but before she did, she told me that... Dinner was in the oven. I go to the kitchen and pull the metal tray from the oven. I was in luck this evening. Tonight's dinner consists of wild rice soup, roasted asparagus, mashed potatoes, and a small beef filet. Separating my food from his, I reach into my pocket and I pull out a small vial of the poison. I sprinkle a bit on top of the soup and Stir it in, making sure there are no clumps, and sprinkle some more on the asparagus, and then season the filet with a generous dose. <sighs> Putting the bottle back into my pocket, I place his food in a silver serving tray and carry it into the study. I don't need verbal permission to enter when I'm bringing his food. The cane is still across his lap, and I feel those vulture's eyes following me as I enter. I set the tray on his desk and set a folding tray up in front of him, after I place his food down, he pats my arm. Thank you. You're too good to me. Damn it. The whole thing would be much easier if he was just an old bastard all the time. Why don't you taste the soup, dear, and let me know if it's warm enough for you? He picks up the spoon, dips into the soup, and takes a long slurp. Smacking his lips, he says, Oh, that's, that's good. Thank you, cookie. A small part of me wants to take this soup and dump it, but once he uses that term of endearment, one I really hate, cookie, I decide to stand there for a moment and watch him eat. Will there be anything else, dear? No, I think I'm good. I'll call you when I'm done. I'm not sure how long it takes for the poison to finish him off. I'm hoping that for the moment he will gag and grab his neck, but it never happens. Poisonings aren't like they are in the movies. I walk back to the kitchen and eat my food standing at the counter. It's just too lonely to sit at the dining room table all by myself. The evening gives way to the silence of his cane. At nine, I go to his study door to see if he's dead. Most nights by this time, he would have summoned me to help him get ready for bed. And some nights he falls asleep in his chair and I just leave him there until he wakes. Tonight looks to be one of those nights. On the television, a lion is chasing an antelope. One animal killing another, his favorite thing to watch. I stand in the doorway for a moment. The room is dark, and all I can make out in the flickering light of the television is he slumped in his chair. The cursed cane lay across his lap, its eyes mocking me. I notice no movement from breathing, so I venture forth. With years of yelling at me for the most minor of infractions, I half expect him to sit up and scream at me to get the hell out of his study. 
But he does none of that now. I kneel in front of him. No breathing that I can detect. I hold a finger under his nose and feel no movement of air. Oh, it's over. I can't believe it. My heart pounds on my chest, part in exhilaration, part in fear. Now I can take him to bed and in the morning report his death. Standing, I turn the television off. What the hell? He screams and I jump. What are you doing in my study? I, oh, I was going to take you to bed. Oh. Get out! He screams and jabs me with his cane. He hits me in the left side hard and I fall to the floor. Get out, get out, get out! He jabs at me again. I grab for the cane and manage to yank it out of his hands. Without thinking, I swing it towards him. The vulture's head connects with his left temple with a, with a cracking thud. At first I think it's the cane breaking, but the old man falls out of his chair and I see blood pooling on the floor. Oh, how the hell am I going to explain this? A 93-year-old man found dead in his bed is easy to explain, but a 93-year-old man lying on the floor in a pool of his own blood, not so much. I complained on several occasions that we should have some live-in help so I didn't have to be at his beck and call, but now I'm glad he never caved. With our chef already gone home and our cleaning crew not scheduled to come for a few days, I feel some relief, and I have some time to work. Though I hadn't planned it earlier, I, I finish preparing my garden for a spring planting. There are no plants yet, just some freshly tilled soil. Digging a hole in my garden big enough to accommodate a person, a wheelchair, and his wretched cane does not appeal to me, but I know that it has to be done, and my garden is the perfect place for it. I like the idea of my flowers getting their nutrients off that old bastard's body. I walk out the garden shed, but I don't turn on any of the lights. We don't have many neighbors, but all the ones we do are close enough to notice a light. Digging a hole is more work than I ever thought, though. When I finish, it's quite late and I'm tired. It looks like the first rays of morning are kissing the horizon. I just hope filling a hole is much easier than digging it. I head back to the study, and my blonde hair clings to my scalp in sweaty, dirty clumps. I feel disgusting. I take my shoes off outside so I don't drag any unnecessary dirt into the house. There's no need to make more work for myself. I lock the wheels of his chair. I lift him back into it. He's heavier than I thought he'd be. But I manage. I grab his cane. The vulture eyes, both those blue sapphire vulture eyes, are staring back at me, taunting me, judging me. We know what you've done, they seem to say. I wheel him out to the garden. I shove him into the hole, chair included. I drop the cane in as well. And the last I see of her two beady blue orbs looking back at me as I drop the first empty bottle of thallium, then shovel after shovel full of dirt back into the grave. The sun has made its full rise over the rise, and I have the hole filled in. My garden once again looks ready for spring planting. I retrace my steps, making sure there are no wheel tracks or anything else that will betray me. I head back to the study. I clean up the small pool of blood. I'm glad for hardwood floors now, as the cleanup only takes a few minutes. I guess if anyone gets curious, they might find some blood between the cracks, but I'm just too tired to worry about that right now. I'll do a better job in the morning. After I shower, I fold into bed. No, oh, I'm hearing the cane even in my dreams now. I wake just before four in the afternoon, disoriented, and then I hear the thumping again. It can't be possible. I put that cane in the ground. Why am I hearing that infernal sound? Well, then it comes to me. Someone's pounding on the front door. Four in the afternoon, I look terrible. If I answer the door my current state, it might arise suspicion. Oh, but if I play sick? I throw on my terry cloth robe and I head to the door. Whoever is pounding on the door has about as much patience as my dead husband. It takes me a few minutes to get to that door. I'm still quite tired. Who knew that digging a grave could be so tiring? I suppose some of us here probably know that, but I never knew it before. The door creaks as I open it. Charles Langford, my husband's accountant, stands at the front porch, and he looks a bit nervous. Um, sorry to bother you, but, uh... He trails off when he sees me. You okay, Lillian? I'm just a bit under the weather today, Charles. Oh, well, look, I'm sorry you don't feel well, and I hate to be a bother. I, I did try to call first, but no one answered. Um, Albert didn't show up for his monthly meeting today. Is he all right? 
Yes, he's fine as far as I know. I've, I've been in bed all day, and to be honest, I haven't seen him today. I tried to look concerned, but feeling as if I'm not pulling it off very well. Are you sure he knew about your meeting today? I've been his accountant for more than 30 years, Lily, and he never missed one of our monthly meetings. A man likes to count his money. Yes, that is very true. I have access to the accounts, but the old Cretan did keep a tight watch over how much I spent and where. And now that he's disappeared, I'll have to keep control of my spending. No big ticket items, no major surgeries. But I suppose a little injection here and there won't be noticed. Look, <coughs> I'm sorry. We had a bit of a fight last night. I just didn't take the time this morning to find out where he was going. But if I see him, I'll tell you you're looking. For, I'll tell him you're looking for him. All right. I start to close the door. Uh, um, Lillian, are you sure he's not here? I mean, his car is in the driveway. Damn it. The car. I didn't think of the car. Though he could afford it, the bastard never hired a driver, insisting he could drive himself. Well, more often than not, I would run his errands for him, but never once did I go with him to his monthly meeting with Charles. My tired brain works fast. Oh, he called a car service this morning. I heard him mumble something about that piece of crap not starting again. And <laughs> We're not smart enough to have AAA like they do in Houston, you know. I think he's going to see you about buying a new one. But if he was to see you and he didn't sh show... Calm down, calm down, Charles says. I'm sure he's fine. He probably just mm, lost track of time. He, uh, uh... If you see Albert, can you ask him to give me a call? Sure. Not a problem. I closed the door. Before I could get it all the way closed, Charles asked, oh, you, you, Million, you mind if I look around? I mean, his face reddens a bit. I know you're not feeling well, but it'd be, it'd be, it'd ease my mind to be sure. You, you know, he looks as if he's going to drop his request for just the briefest of moments, and I pause, hoping he will, but he doesn't. We walk together. Charles talks as he glances in the room now. I don't hear him. Instead, I hear hear it, a faint. It's barely audible, <laughs> but it's there, like a distant bark. Charles is still talking, but I don't listen. We approach the study. I stop in the driveway, in the doorway. Charles continues in the room. He knows this is the main room where my husband resides in, and he takes his time to look around. It's louder this time, and closer. I look around the room. I did a decent job of cleaning up the blood, but sitting where the stain is is, is one blue sapphire. One of the vulture's wicked eyes. No, no, I must be imagining it. I, 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 both sapphires were still in the cane when I tossed into the grave. I, I saw them. I know. The sound becomes louder. And I'm, sorry, I'm sure Charles can hear it now. How can he not? Charles can hear it. I know he can hear it. all part of that old bastard's plans. Louder and louder. How is it possible? I struggle against the urge to go back to the, the back door, throw it open, and run out to the garden. I fake another cough. Well, maybe Charles will get the hint and leave, but he says something that I don't hear, and Charles is mocking me. He knows. I'm sweating. Are you all right, Lillian? It's the first words I've heard from him since he entered the house. Can't you hear it? A look of concern crosses his face. That! He grabs my shoulders. Are you all right, Lillian? I cover my ears. I can't take it anymore. He's in the garden! I scream as I fall to the floor. Dig him up! Please! Please! Dig him up! Call someone! Call the police! Please just make it stop! Charles kneels beside me. Make what stop, hideous Lillian? That sound! The hideous thumping of his damned cane! Oh. Hmm. Just me, or did that remind anyone else of Sally and Dr. Finkelstein in The Nightmare Before Christmas? Oh, uh, well. <clears throat> so our next one is... Once Upon a Midnight, based on the damn bird poem. In the end, 
the fate of humanity rested in the hands of a woman scorned. Lenny Allen wouldn't have characterized herself in that way, but she'd already triggered one warning from the computer security subroutine by being distracted. The next time, she'd be locked out for 24 hours. The director would not be amused. Normally, Lenny would welcome the security protocols, the retina scan, the voice recognition, code words, fingerprint scanning, mouth were all part of all part of life in one of the nation's highest echelon research facilities. And they helped her sleep at night. No God knew the stuff they handled could be used with a catastrophic effect by the wrong people. It was the Keystroke Dynamics keyboard that turned out to be the biggest pain in the ass, though. If its biometric system ever suspected that she was acting under duress, it would offer only two warnings, then go into complete lockdown. Mendelssohn swore he'd been locked out once as a result of chugging one too many Starbucks. Lenny was finding it hard to care about inventing global cataclysm when her own world was falling apart, though. Oh, she loved working in WCSD. The development and analysis of worst-case scenario made good use of her vivid imagination, an overflowing cup of personal paranoia. In fact, it was often cathartic. If she could imagine the very worst things that could happen to the planet and devise potential responses to them, it robbed her own personal fears, fears and troubles of their potency. But not this time. Not this time for Lenny. Ed was gone. Ed left three nights ago. The notification of divorce proceedings had been delivered to her this morning. God, that was fast. What was his hurry? Considering that Lenny hadn't suspected a thing until three nights and 23 minutes ago. Maybe that was what hurt the most. That she'd been so blind. Lenny, the genius, her friends called her. Not so smart after all. Wrapped up in her work, imagining the worst terrible things that could happen to a world without realizing that sometimes the world came down to just two people. She ran her hands over a glossy black workstation. It was her link to the powerful computer nexus that produced the Reichman Analog Virtual Environment. A long name with a catchy acronym that was more important to people who wrote the checks. Those gray-suited, dark-tied, backroom government autocrats had seen enough plain old supercomputers. They needed a name that could jazz up a, a bland requisition reposal, proposal and bamboozle a room full of auditors. Lenny never used the full title. To her, the rave nexus was part taskmaster, part playground. From its matrix to graphics imaging software, the intelligent problem solving and pure brute processing speed sprang forth creations of startling realism. Lenny could step into a three-dimensional projection of a pristine globe, key in the disaster parameters, and watch it bleed in spreading pools around her. As a biologist, her specialty was pandemics. It was a sexy topic, had been since the first years of the century for some reason. Scientists had latched onto the idea that pandemics followed some kind of regular schedule and the world was overdue. After that, it was a matter of course that every biological outbreak anywhere attracted an inordinate amount of attention from global media fascinated with dying things. And if the scientific community found that the modestly fanning the flames meant mounds of research money thrown their way, well, who could really blame them? Lenny's job was to gather Everything from their most carefully assembled data to their wildest flights of fancy and feed it to the raven. Then the cyber mind was charged with accessing the probabilities of every scenario, analyzing the etiology, predicting the spread pattern, forecasting the fatality rates, yeah, prophesying over the quick and the dead. They ran several scenarios a week. The human race had nearly been eradicated dozens of times. Lenny and the raven were very good at their job. Now, though, disaster had invaded her own reality. She felt it like a poison in her veins. Her vision lost its focus. Her fingers miscarried on the keys. What had gone so wrong in the life they'd shared? She and Ed. Eddie. She always called him Eddie because he called her Lenny. He was a sports writer. Everyone in the world called was called Bobby or Jimmy or Scotty, weren't they? He dreamed of being a political reporter. Would he have called the, the president Barry? The screen was angrily flashing an image at her. It was the corporate logo of the Reichman Analog Corporation, a rep representation of the Palace Athena, goddess of war and wisdom. Damn, she entered the safe code to reset the security function. She had to concentrate or the raven would kick her ass, and deservedly so. It wasn't just computer modeling that the raven controlled. All of Level 7 was a full-blown hazmat lab operated robotically, the substances studied in there were so dangerous that humans rarely ventured inside, except for the Ph.D. equivalent of janitorial work. 
The test tubes and beakers and petri dishes belonged to the raven. Inside were samples of the rickettsia bacteria, the villain behind typhus and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Aronaviridae, virus viruses responsible for the Lassa fever, Ebola virus, the coronavirus that produced SARS, Marburg virus, several different strains of avian type A influenza, viruses of the H5, H7, H9 subtypes capable of infecting humans, and even a few precious grams of the 1918 Spanish flu. Cold from a corpse frozen in the Alaskan permafrost. Some of the most deadly pathogens known to humankind. All held in the capable pincers of a cybernetic brain and its robotic minions. It was the stuff of sci-fi fright movies, but Lenny wasn't worried. The raven had the abilities of an artificial intelligence in many ways, but no independent thought. She liked to say that even if the supercomputer could take over the world, the raven was too smart to want it. No. There were far more dangers from humans screwing up, maybe because they couldn't keep their inconvenient emotions from getting in the way. Lenny reached for a cup of coffee that was hours cold, put it down with a grimace. They were running simulations of the avian flu outbreaks again this week, although it had been years since the first flare-ups of the H5N1 strain in Hong Kong in the late 1990s, and the more frightening outbreaks later in Southeast Asia, and the best minds said the H5N1 or something like it was still lurking in the shadows, waiting for its moment to strike. Every so often it would appear in a flock of domestic fowl somewhere around the globe, and a massive slaughter would follow. In 2018, and there hadn't been a documented case of H5N1 human-to-human transmission beyond one secondary pandemic. One secondary victim was a pandemic held in check because the virus couldn't spread yet beyond the human population. The flu viruses mutate like there's no tomorrow. A flock of wild ducks might fly over a poultry farm, leaving behind a bombardment of infected droppings. Wandering chickens would spread the virus to the nearby stock of pigs, one or two of which had been already luck- unlucky enough to pick up a dose of the human flu from the overly attentive farmer Nagayan. Once inside the accommodating bloodstream of the swine, the two visiting viruses could swap a few genes and presto, a new strain of bird flu capable of spreading among Homo sapiens. And within a few days, farmer Nagayan and his family would have ruined lungs filled with blood as their bodies misguided the immune systems deployed cellular soldiers that destroyed the very tissues they were meant to save. In the outside world, the process of mutation was random and slow. It was a different story among the gleaming white walls of Level 7. There was a macabre array of stainless steel bones danced with, within plexiglass cylinders, slicing and dicing and splicing finding new recipes of DNA, shiny new double strands of nucleotides mixed and matched from human diseases and those of the animal kingdoms with the deliberate purpose of creating new pathogens deadly to humans, giving them new functions, helping them gain it, as it were. The rationale was that by creating these lethal agents, we could soon learn somehow to fight them better. Lenny was always grateful that she didn't tend to remember her dreams. She also felt that her own hands were clean. She didn't create the murderous agents. She only ran simulations of their path of destruction. When she and the raven turned the new killer loose, it was only on a virtual globe, an ethereal construct of numbers and electrical impulses, sanitized, safe. Lenny provided the data, and the computer showed her Armageddon. She would never admit it to anyone, but it was morbidly fascinating to watch the world's dominant species die a thousand gruesome deaths particularly if at least one of the virtual victims bore the face of Eddie. No, that wasn't true. That wasn't true. She didn't want him dead. Maybe the blame was hers. She'd always known the secrets could tear a relationship apart. Her father's military career had poisoned her own parents' marriage after he'd been promoted into the upper echelons of the Pentagon and had to hide the details of his work day from his own wife. After that, the trust was gone and the fire along with it. Lenny had watched it happen. Lenny had vowed never to make the same mistake, but that was exactly what she had done. It wasn't just her job security demand. She told herself she was she was protecting Eddie from the horrors of Level 7 for his own good. It wasn't healthy to live day after day with the threat of biological holocaust hanging like the sword of Damocles in the mind's eye. Some people couldn't take it and spent the rest of their lives in therapy. And so Lenny couldn't tell Eddie about her work, and she couldn't tell him why not. But Eddie wasn't a fool. He suspected something. Eventually it turned into the conviction that she was involved in something big. 
a potential hot story that could be his entree into the political arena. She was sure he hadn't come up with that idea on his own. It had the perfume taint of that blonde internet blogger he talked to about more and more often, the one who was always digging for government conspiracies, the one with the inflated ego and the inflated chest. Oh, God, was that what had happened? Had an outline, online correspondence sparked an offline romance? Oh, Eddie, Eddie, did I drive you to that? Lenny felt a hot tear well up and had to snap her head away before it could splash onto the keyboard. <laughs> No. She didn't want Eddie dead. She was furious, cruelly hurt, and hopelessly infatuated all at the same time. She loved Eddie beyond reason, and even now she knew that she would take him back without hesitation. If he asked. <laughs> yeah, but what were the odds of that? Predicting those, <laughs> predicting odds like that would take more skill than she had. It would require a master of predictions. <laughs> no. No, no. The idea was ridiculous. Lenny turned her head away from the screen and imprisoned her hands beneath her legs to restrain them while she rocked back and forth in confusion. But there was no one else in the lab. It likely wouldn't be for another 45 minutes. Her co-workers liked to take long lunches. And Lenny knew how to erase almost all traces of her commands, except in the raven's deepest, deepest core memory. Did she dare? Inevitable as a pandemic itself, she surrendered seven minutes later and began to key in the data. The raven already had dreams of information about Lenny. She quickly faded a rough profile of Eddie and warts and all, resisting the powerful temptation to embellish the warts. Query, will Lenny and Eddie get back together? There was no sign of activity from the raven. There never was. But 60 seconds was an eternity of processing time for a task that involved no global modeling, no quantum variables, and no fancy graphics and 128-bit studio precision color. The screen finally came back to life. Raven. Insufficient data. She exhaled a long-held breath and realized her hands were trembling. Now she didn't try, dare try it again, though. It was sheer idiocy to have done it in the first place. She spent the next five minutes covering her tracks. The rest of the afternoon was excruciating. Each time someone came over to speak to her, she expected them to hiss a withering accusation about using lab facilities for a personal whim. She vowed that she would never give in to such unworthy impulse again. Lenny hurried home that night in relief and dreamed of a spinning globe projected midair with her face on one side and Eddie's face on the other, and she could only watch helplessly as scenario after scenario brought spreading patches of emptiness like a cancer between them. At the first coffee break the next morning, she asked again, Raven, insufficient data. This time she didn't delete the inquiry. She merely hid it behind layers of other tasks. But it waited there for her to call it up, at first at lunch, then at afternoon break, and eventually whenever she had the room to herself, in between, her mind would wander from cross-indexing fatality rates to trying to recall any memories of her marriage that might help her in her cupidian quest. Raven, insufficient data. In frustration, she nearly pounded a fist on the keyboard. But that might trigger another com computation. Because of the dynamic interface, the machine already finished most of her sentences for her. They'd worked together for so long it, <clears throat> it anticipated nearly every keystroke. Instead, she chastised herself again for obsessing over her husband. Ex-husband. And tried to force her tense fingers to relax on the keys. She was startled to see the screen begin to fill with words, beginning with X, exacerbate, exact, exacting, exaggerate. She quickly keyed in a terminate command. The raven was getting too damned helpful for her own good. But not helpful where it really counted. Why couldn't the supercomputer produce an answer for her? Why didn't it even try? The question was too simple. That must be it. She needed to approach it like any other scenario, build a model, then enter the data, run the simulation. But well, that would take time. She could never accomplish that much in a couple of coffee breaks. She had to she had to work overtime, which meant she needed a cover story. Say her last pandemic simulation had run into bugs <laughs> of the computer, not the biological variety. But she was close to tracking them down and didn't want to lose momentum. Her supervisor accepted the fiction readily enough. Lenny was one of his best workers, after all. In any way, she was on a salary. But she had to be careful. There was still a possibility that someone else might be working late and walk in on her. It was even possible that one of the security people would make a random check on her workstation. She needed a shadow screen, a secondary display she could bring up with a 
stroke of a key. Only a task, only a real task would be convincing enough to fool a colleague, but she'd just finished the last of the most recent series of simulations. Well, what else would look plausible? She called up the Raven's latest results from level seven and instantly regretted it. A quick scan of the data caused her blood to drain from her face. Good God. This was the worst one yet. A strain of virus that appeared to be based on hemagglutin-5 and neurodimethase-1, but had stitched on RNA from half a dozen sources. The testing just completed left that afternoon showed a startling 100% lethality. Virtually unheard of. Early indications revealed a six- or seven-day incubation period followed by fatality within four days. That alone made it much more dangerous than killers like Ebola. They killed their hosts so quickly they rarely spread very far from the original source of the infection. This new creation had no such weakness. It was the perfect traveler. Well, God help us if... Lenny didn't let her mind complete the thought. Instead, she began the practice routine of building the computer model but completed it for her. The horrific allure of the new pathogen was nearly enough to distract Lenny from her original purpose. It was the moment when the world could have been saved. That moment. <laughs> uh, by like so many moments, it came and passed. And destiny or fate or evolution dictated otherwise. The pull of her aching heart was stronger. Once the basic parameters of her scenario had been established... She allowed the raven to fill in the rest, adding only the simple command to run the program and then terminate. Run the program, then terminate. Then she turned back to her private project, the reunion of Lenny and Eddie. The best case scenario. It happened only minutes before midnight. She awakened to the sound of the alarms and the pain there where the keys had been embedded in her cheek. Had they caught her? The klaxon reverberated through the room, piercing her ears until her jaw ached. Warning lamps painted the walls in spasms of color. Finally gathering her wits together, she snapped her head up to look at what they called the big screen. A liquid crystal panel mounted from the ceiling that displayed announcements for all staff and alerts of any kind. It was mutely screaming in giant fluorescent letters. It was a breach on level seven. A deadly toxin was loose. Already an army of biohazard experts would be scrambling into the hazmat suits. She could picture them racing down in echoing hallways to bring the enemy to battle. Yet even as she watched, her initial alarm turned to helpless horror. The vents were opening. The outside vents of the lab were intended to exhaust toxic gases in the event of a fire. They were a dangerous necessity, but there were countless failsafe systems to prevent them from ever opening in the aftermath of a spill, exactly the kind of accident she was now witnessing. Those fail states could not be overridden manually by a murderous saboteur or a terrorist maniac. That had been demonstrated again and again before the lab could even be built. No one could open the vents to open air once a breach alert had been sounded. No human. The raven. The computer must have allowed it. Good God, it could it have been caused by something she had done? Lenny's fingers flew frantically over the keyboard recalling the recent list of commands and actions. Luminous letters reflected in her wet eyes. No. Oh, no. It wasn't possible. The last command line excuse, accused her from the screen like an executioner's pointing finger. Run program. Exterminate. She slumped back in the chair. Her vacant eyes came to focus on the holographic globe suspended in the midair before her, running its final simulation. Blotches of invading crimson ate their way around the ghostly blue projection of her home world, almost more quickly than she could see. In a daze, she tapped in a trio of keys to check the time scale and drew a ragged breath and expanded the range to slow the simulation down. This time she could see the wash of salmon color representing the transmission of the virus racing around the globe in a flash, immediately afterward followed by the blood-red flood of fatality moving slowly for the first 10 or 15 seconds, then almost instantly transforming the whole mottled earth into a, a pulsing red beacon of warning. Stunned, Lenny stood and walked into the center of the projection, then turned slowly in place, swept her gaze over each quadrant. The, there was nowhere left untouched. No safe haven of res shelter or resilience, not even in the Himalayas or in the desert of Suzanne, Sudan or even the barren Antarctic. 
A flicker of movement drew her attention back to the big screen of her head. Its glaring fluorescent letters had been replaced with an epithet of damning words. Query, will Lenny and Eddie get back together again? Raven, nevermore. Oh, okay, we got time. Wow, we got time. <clears throat> that might be one of my favorite ones in the book. Okay, so this next one is called The Atherton House, <clears throat> based on The Fall of the House of Usher. <clears throat> I'm not a writer. I'm not at all remarkable or interesting person, and I am certainly not clever. Under normal circumstances, the thought of precisely straightening a sheet of paper, pressing down upon the worn keys, and hammering out a story would be abhorrent to me. However, I feel obliged, no compelled, to tell the truth about what happened the day I traveled to the Atherton house. Even though writing that name makes my fingers tremble. No, I'm not a writer. But anybody who knows me would assure you that I am a truthful man. You must believe what I'm about to describe. You must. It was late autumn when the silent taxi driver dropped me at the front of the palace. The trees were bare, their leaves strewn like rotting corpses across the lonely path, but the chilly sun seemed to mock the idea of trailing any light into the shady drive. The tall iron gates were rusty and contorted into grotesque leers and seemed as if they had not been opened for a long time. The road was silent and smelled musty and forgotten. But as I pressed against the gate and a screeching cry echoed through the estate, I felt as though something was watching me. Now, I'm not a superstitious man. Indeed, I pride myself on my cerebral disposition and unshakable rationality. But you must believe me when I confide that as I stepped through the gate of the Atherton House, my senses were heightened to an animalistic intensity. The crunch of my feet against the rotting leaves was intolerably piercing to my ears and the slightest touch on my fingers against the rough iron was as chilling as death. The smell of moss and ivy was so moldy that I could not breathe for retching, and the sparkle of every cobweb glinted before my eyes. I have never attributed great weight to feelings, choosing instead to weigh up decisions according to the relative pros and cons. With every agonizing step, though, a bestial instinct rose up inside me and gripped my heart like the sudden chill of a stormy wind. Run. Run. Turn around. Run like a frightened animal. Do not look back. Of course, I dismissed these thoughts as the childish whims of someone recovering from a long journey. As I trod the overgrown pathway and noticed how vicious creepers had angrily reclaimed crumbling stone ornaments, I tried to recall the last time I had actually seen Demelza de Atherton. She was so quiet and strange that even though I had a vague recollection of her un comfortable present in our office. I struggled to pinpoint exactly when I had last felt the cold breeze as the metals I walked past me. Now, I'm not known for being a sociable person myself in the office. I, I, arrive, I arrive at work precisely on time. I work diligently at whichever documents need to be copied, or edited, or sorted, and then I leave at some hour in the evening. However, I always get, greet my colleagues in the office with a polite tip of my hat when occasionally I glance and see a pale, thinned Faced double of myself, also furiously copying beneath a pile of yellowing papers. Without exception, I, I bestow upon them a generous smile that often makes them comment about the weather or the daily commute. I understand that I am considered to be a dull, perhaps standoffish, but well-meaning and efficient member of the agency. I have worked there for many years. Now, the Melza de Atherton was a different case altogether. The Melza arrived to work early and was always the last to leave. To the extent that people whispered and joked, she slept among the papers. She certainly had the wild appearance of one who does not live a normal measured existence. Her hair was an explosion of wires at different lengths, as if she had been electrocuted, and her skin was deathly pale, as if she never saw the light of the sun. Her eyes were crazed like an animal about to be attacked, or perhaps to attack. They were big and beady, as though she was mad through lack of sleep. The Melza never spoke to anybody in the office, except for the occasional grunt, and people soon gave up attempting to speak with De Melza at all, collectively deciding that she was rude. De Melza had an erratic excuse to work. Sometimes she would stare at the notice board in front of her as though she were in a trance. 
On other occasions, she would attack her tasks with ferocity, like a lion ripping apart its prey. Sometimes she would tear papers with her nails, spilling ink across them, or screw them up with an erupting volcano of frustration. Often it would be me who was asked to stay late and rewrite her work as it was useless to anybody. The hours of copying her crazy handwriting sometimes made me feel a little unhinged. I would let out, ang I would let out an angry cry or a long musical laugh. I'm not, an ease I'm not a person easily troubled. But Miss Atherton made me feel uneasy. When she was not tearing up papers, Demelza spoke loudly on the telephone to somebody named James. That is how I know all about, about her that they do. I'm not nosy, but it was impossible not to hear her half of the conversation. She would shout and scream at James, slamming down the telephone, knocking over pots of pens. She once even threw her coffee chair, her office chair across the room and knocked over a table, making a flurry of papers catch flight like butterflies. Some people thought James was her husband. Others claimed he was her brother. I personally thought he might be a cousin. Whoever he was, I hoped the poor man had strong nerves. There were several mysteries surrounding Demelza. The first was why she was working at the office at all. It was well known that the Athertons were an old aristocratic family. There was a, it was possible to walk from Oxford to Cambridge purely on the Atherton land. Their estate, it was rumored, was so large that one could find themselves lost in the grounds forever. Their house, or rather castle, I am led to believe it was something between the two, had, had almost a thousand rooms, and two people could live there and never see each other. Certainly one could scream at the top of his lungs and never be heard. The first mystery, therefore, was why such a rich lady should need to find employment in an office in the first place. The second mystery was, given her conduct and inability to copy even a singular document without tearing it to pieces, how she managed to keep her job. And the third mystery about Demelza, in which I find myself inexplicably tied up, is why Demelza de Atherton disappeared. <clears throat> Excuse me, sir. I piped up one day in the office. The workers, with their translucent skin and long bony noses, all stopped copying documents and turned their sneering eyes in my direction. There was an eerie silence. Nobody ever speaks to the boss. Miss Jenkins, the back of the boss's black cat said. He did not turn around. Actually, sir, I quivered. Actually, sir, it's Watkins. Miss Jenkins, he repeated more loudly, this time with a tightness to his tone. <clears throat> Watkins, I cleared my throat. <clears throat> it's about Miss Demelza Datherton, sir. The boss turned around in his spinning office chair. His face was round, fat, and pink, and he had a mustaches. He had big, bushy brow eye eyebrows, and one of them was raised. She's disappeared, sir. The boss stood up. His black jacket matching black trousers gave him the appearance of a large crow. Has anyone seen Mr. Melza de Atherton? He boomed. Everybody turned like mice back to their desk and scurried back to their writing. When was the last time anybody saw her? Hmm? The scratching of busy pens and clicking of creaky typewriter became louder and faster. Well, Jenkins, he said without looking at me, I suppose you'd better go and see what's become of her. Me? Why me? It was a general gasp, like a sudden gust of wind circulating the office. The boss raised his eyebrow further so it almost touched his forehead. <laughs> it's just that I don't know her, Jenkins. I don't even know where she lives. <sighs> Be ridiculous. Everybody knows Demelza, Miss Demelza Datherton lives at Datherton House, somewhere between Oxford and Cambridge. Yes, yes. Well, call a taxi cab. Go down at once. And, even, and if you even think about charging the taxi to the company, Jenkins, the last thing you do. But, sir, what about... Your copying can wait. Go. As I walked the seemingly endless drive to the crumbling house, I mulled the events of the day over my mind and I felt slightly annoyed. However, the decrepit, demonic gargoyles glared at me with every step, and the feeling was soon devoured by one of vague, unidentifiable fear. I am sure, I muse, that there is a perfectly rational explanation for the woman's disappearance. She probably just decided to quit her job at the company. God knows the thought has occurred more than once in my mind. I am a long-serving, reliable employee. By the time I had reached the house, it was completely dark, except for a bright white moon sat high in the cloudless sky. It gave that house a spectral glow as though it were not of this world, a trick of the senses. 
perhaps caused by the wind, than to the faraway sound of howling in the forest. Dogs, or perhaps foxes, seemed to be very close. I pulled my suit jacket tight around my body. My skin felt prickly, but I think that it was merely a response to the cold, wet night. The old wooden door of the house towered above me, and the bulky iron hinges swam before my eyes like insects. I hesitated and pulled the frayed, damp cord of the heavy metal bell. Its clang was discordant, as if angry at being disturbed. I stood on the stone step for several minutes and shivered. The house certainly seemed unoccupied. It occurred to me that perhaps the family had abandoned it. Dilapidated manor houses were an expense and lacked modern conveniences. It was common these days for ancient families to relocate more to more modern residences in town. I wondered whether Demelza would be annoyed to see me and think it rude, or whether she would even remember who I was. Eventually the door opened with a disgruntled howl. I stepped forward into the thick shadows of it. First I thought nobody was there. Yes. A thin, high voice whispered from the shadows. I presume it was a servant, though I never saw the face. At first, my voice croaked and stumbled in my throat because my mouth had become inexplicably dry. And then I removed my hat and said, I'm here to see Miss Deatherton. Please tell her it's Jeffrey Watkins from the office. The person did not reply. But I discerned the movements of a hunched figure and heard the pat of footsteps like the steps, steps of an animal slipping further away. Now, I've mentioned that I'm not a curious person by nature, but I am observant and I tend to remember what I've seen. As I stood alone in the dim hallway, it occurred to me that I was most fortunate to be a, a guest at a place of such historical interest. The wide, sweeping hallway was grand but empty. It was a cavernous stone fireplace buried in a thick layer of cobwebs and dust and a heavy suit of armor which was positioned at the exact angle to give the impression it was staring at me. A wide, twisting staircase swept upward towards the first floor. <laughs> it was not to my taste. Each dark wooden banister was gnarled and had been carved into the shape of an angry demon, and the shadow pattern of the bars fell across the stairway, giving the impression of a, a prison cell. Lining the wall there was a series of portraits, all painstakingly realistic, and it realized in dark oil paints. Each was of a woman of the Deatherton ancestral line, and there were copies of the pointed nose and beady-eyed features of Demelza, or rather she was a copy of them. They all looked angrily and watchful in there. Position behind the main window of the hallway meant that years of light had made them both fade into ghosts and also sharpen their peering glance. Just as I was pondering these artifacts and making a copy of them in my mind, the figure of a bright white woman appeared at the top of the stairs. A flash of terror pierced through me, but then, of course, I realized it was Demelza, and that standing in front of the moonlight it made her appear to glow with ethereal translucence, creating the illusion of a ghost. Miss Datherton, I said, bowing obsequiously. The grandeur of the surroundings impressed upon me needed the need to behave with utmost courtesy. She glided towards me. Uh, hello, Hawkins. Her manner was pleasant and relaxed as if she was surprised to see me. But she did not show it. Time away from the office had clearly had a positive effect on the woman. Her skin seemed brighter, her hair flatter, her pupils had ceased to bulge. Standing in the hallway of her ancestral house, she seemed like a perfectly normal, if aristocratic woman. I felt a burning surge of guilt for the fantastical rumors that had circulated about her in the office. I felt embarrassed and awkward for stumbling into the privacy of Miss Datherton's home. Certainly, I would hate it if someone from the office followed me home and discovered my secrets. I've come from the office, I explained, looking at my polished black shoes. You, you disappeared, Miss Datherton, and we were concerned as to your whereabouts. Her smile did not fade exactly, but it set in place like dry glue. Ah, oh, yes, she said through her teeth. Yes, well, you see, Mr. Hawkins, it became necessary to leave the office and return to Datherton House because James, my brother, was extremely ill. In fact, she took a sharp intake of breath through her teeth. In fact, I'm sorry to say that my brother has died. Her face froze into the same glazed stare as the ancestral portraits in the hallway. Ah, uh, I'm very sorry to hear that, Miss Datherton, I said mechanically. I'm not an emotional person, and this kind of situation always makes me feel panicked. My cheeks flushed pink, and it occurred to me that perhaps I should reach out and touch her arm, but there was something repellent about the throbbing veins in her transparent skin. Perhaps it would have been the wrong gesture entirely, anyway. She stood in the pale moonlight like the statues in the garden. 
I waited for it to offer me a drink or at least invite me into the drawing room. But I suppose with the grief and the fact that she'd been alone for a while, not to mention her frosty manners at the best of times, she did something that under normal circumstances would have seemed a bit peculiar. Would you like to see him? I shuddered, but then quickly recollected my sensibilities. I had already been unspeakably brood, rude, arriving unannounced at the home of a grieving stranger. Gamelza looked stonily composed, but I felt sorry for her. I decided I had no option. I certainly, I mumbled. Gamelza took a solitary candle and turned towards a dark doorway. We tiptoed down a gloomy stone staircase, which twisted down into a cellar long way below the ground. There was a series of stone arches, and the cold, lightless passageway became increasingly narrow. I knew it was fairly common for ancient families to have crypts in which generations of ancestors lay silently and resisted decay. I had not given much thought to what such places felt like. The cold stone walls seemed to press down and against us. Rows of historical figures lay beneath the cold shrouds like cakes beneath napkins or children sleeping in bunk beds. I imagine them all with the same pointed nose and beady features of the Datherton family, a hundred frozen demelzas lined up in a row like toy soldiers. If I were not such a rational man, I might have entertained the notion that one of those figures turned its head beneath the sheet. Demelza paced coolly to the end of the row and lifted the paper-thin wisp of cloth that had been resting over James Datherton. Say hello to James, she said. Mr. James Datherton was a carbon copy of his deathly pale sister. He had the same angular features like a pecking bird. I had expected his eyes to be closed as though in a peaceful sleep, but they were open like glassy marbles. Good evening, Mr. Datherton, I said nervously. I'm not sure why I was a whimsical and out of character. Demelza stood in the silence, letting the candle burn down the wick. It flickered wildly, making a dazzling light show of specters on the wall. I felt like the suitable time had elapsed that we should turn back towards the land of the living. However, Demelza was resolutely fixed to the hard stone floor. She showed no sign of movement. Now, I am a sensible person. I pride myself on my sound judgment. I beg you to believe that what I am about to relate. Without prior warning, there was a low, harrowing moan and a shuffling sound. I spun around to face the corpse of Mr. James Deatherton. Demelza's eyes flickered, but she did not flinch. All of a sudden, James Deatherton turned his head, fixed his bulging eyes in our direction, raised his pale arm. I screamed, Miss Deatherton, Miss Deatherton, your brother is not dead. Oh, he's quite dead. You must be having a funny turn, Jenkins. People of a certain sensitive um, nature find places such as this one offensive to their sensibilities. Mr. James Datherton lurched towards her with his withered arm. Miss Datherton, uh, Miss Datherton, I really must leave. Demelza turned towards her like a dressmaker's dummy on wheels. Mr. Jenkins, you are not going anywhere. But my eyes bulged and I bit my lip. The taxi's waiting. I really must go. She sneered and let a sinister snort from the side of her mouth that reminded me when I used to work with her in the office. The taxi's gone, she announced with the faintest trace of a laugh. Oh, yes, it's gone. The corpse, or ghost, or perhaps live figure of Mr. James Deatherton leaned towards me with a bestial cry of horror, making a snap decision which is unusual for my character. I pushed Miss Deatherton, sending her flying with such force that she flew across the crypt and cracked her head in its ancient stone wall. Then, with no doubt in my mind that she was lying dead on the floor amongst generations of her family, I left my hat and my jacket and I ran. I ran like a fox pursued by bloodhounds, leaving that foul, crazed woman to bleed to death on the floor. Yes, you must believe me. You must believe me when I tell you that I had no other choice. The Datherton House or the fall of the House of Usher. And speaking of no other choices, well, you do have a choice. We have one more short story left. I have no choice, but I have to read it because it's in the script. And besides, it makes um, a perfect halfway for the book so that we'll have a half left to do again another time. So if you're able to stick around, you might enjoy this one. It's called Vanity, based on the oval portrait by um, the birthday boy, Mr. Edgar Allan Poe. If or not, I totally understand 
and we'll see what we can do. Thank you, thank you. Mirror, mirror on the wall. That was a relative of mine. I did not admit with shame either. Rather, I, I'm proud to boast of many shadowed history on countless chateau walls. I'm proud to herald that I had bolstered the images of a variety of intriguing women, whether robust or delicate, voluptuous or reedy, withering or ripening. Yes, I showed each that she was beautiful. I engaged my subject. I was certain the typical fate of silvering and aging, which happens to mirrors, from staring endlessly the same images without reaction, would never happen to me. It was a chilly October day. My prior owner Mary's estate sale. There had not been much in my vision all afternoon, save for a dappling sun and leaves, and, and then a sweet, fair face appeared. She had a pretty pink pock mark below the outer corner of one eye. Oh, yes, I had seen birthmarks like it, but never there. It sat like a painted rose on white china. It drew me into her dark eyes. A female voice. Cassie, we, we, we should think about leaving now. As my admirer did not look back over her shoulder in the direction from which the voice had come. Instead, she cocked her head to the left and then to the right, and she mussed her hair. I swelled up to reflect her. I rounded her chin a bit. I blushed her cheeks for her. She gave me a faint smile. I've decided this mirror would be stunning in my bedroom, don't you think? Cassie bought me for less than I was worth, but <laughs> I was not insulted. Yes, she was such a fine creature. I would have begged to be taken home with her for free had she not been willing to pay. She lifted me with a gentle hand. She threw a dust and cat hair powdered blanket over me and put me into the, into the trunk where I, I lay in darkness and felt the bumps in the road as the car traveled on. I anxiously waited for the arrival at Cassie's home. I wanted to study everything she owned. I wanted, I wanted to know Cassie. Oh, every woman in my life had a love for someone. If what I reflected when each looked into me would have an effect on attaining her wildest dreams, I would give it, even if it meant I might lose the fine lady. In my earliest memory, I was frequently passed to a different owner if my current one wed. I would come to expect it was my fate to love and to lose, uh, such as the life of a mirror. When I arrived at Cassie's for the first time, I dreaded that day. For my Cassie, I thought of her as my Cassie now beheld me in ways that none before her had. She scrutinized me closely. She seemed to peer through me, turning this way and that, touching her legs, her arms, her flesh, asking me if I thought she was beautiful. Of course she was, even surpassing the white roses for which she had a passion. There was no part of Cassie's body on which they weren't in bloom. She had art on her shoulder, back, and ankle. She had metal ones which entwined and grew up the outer lobe of her ear. She even had them on her shopping hat, the one I had heard her tell her friend, uh, tell her her uh, tell her friend that her lover Dan had bought her in a fashionable seaside shop. Dan, on and on she talked of Dan at first, never in front of me, always with other females, always from somewhere else in the house. Dan was a painter, and she would babble with excitement over how she was going to be his subject, with a little more work, of course. I'd heard her say on a few occasions, sometimes when I could surmise from the lilt of her voice that she'd been imbibing. On those nights, she would look into me even more deeply, and I'd respond and reflect her loveliness. I would add a little paunch to her cheeks if they looked slightly gaunt, or I, or I, I, I would brush a bit of flesh on her inner arms to match what I'd seen on her that first day she'd lifted me from the grass. And then one night, <clears throat> Cassie did not just look into me, she touched me at the point where my gaze met her thighs. There was a flood of something as I had never felt, like the sound of sand in an hourglass to which I had been close enough to hear, only this feeling not a sound, and then all went black. For a moment I was... I, I could not see. Not enough, Cassie whispered. I am not beautiful enough to be part of Dan's canvas. I must be thinner. I was shocked back to vision. Cassie was, was um, renaissance, as the women in the paper photo hanging over her bed reminded me they were rounded and luminescent, lush and enveloping and 
certainly not fat, and I adored her just that way, every line and shade, the gentle, graceful collarbone, the fleshy swell of her stomach, even when a small bulge rose above her waistband, the breasts, one more angular than its mate, the legs which met in four out of five places. I couldn't bear to have Cassie think that, to show her that I would worship her regardless. I, I daubed on a little extra flesh on her belly. I patted a curve on her thigh. I accentuated the pouf, pouch beneath her chin. I, I waited for her to smile as she had on that day on the lawn. But instead her eyes narrowed at that reflection and she fled from the room. The next dawning she stood before me in a sheer gown, posing forward, backward side, poking her stomach, caressing her knees, pressing her collarbone, wrapping fingers around her wrist, twisting her rings. Then she would dare touch and she'd touch me in the same places, and I would go blind for a second, and then not, and blind, and not, and then always when I was not, I would embellish her, a reflection, a little curve here, a small rise there. Oh, <sighs> we'll make this perfect yet, she said, and then she left, and I could barely stand the anticipation of a return, so I could know what she meant. She arrived harboring a brown bag, and she sat in front of me. This will work, she said, and she spilled the bag's contents on the floor. There are aqua boxes and red boxes and bottles of green glass. I will be a sketch instead of charcoal, if that is what, what Dan wants, so he can love me, so he can draw me. She ripped into the red box with savage delight, opened the small bottle inside, filled her palm with several red pills, and slapped them into her yawing mouth. It became ritual. Cassie took the pills. She pulled herself into a flouncing red dress. She twisted her hair into... A clip crowned with white roses. She stood before me. She turned, cocked her arm, twirled. I rendered flesh upon her each time. To show her by her reflection. To show her my love for her was purer than dance. To show her my love was all she could ever need. <laughs> Not enough, she said. Her bones began to show. Dresses she filled hung off her body. The meeting places in her legs shrank from each other. Her knees whittled to bas relief. The more she looked into me, the angrier she seemed to become, and, and so I worked even harder to, to, to flesh her out, and the amount I, I was required to add each instance grew. I, I expended such energies that sometimes in the shadows when the room was dark and she was in bed, I hardly had energy to watch over her. Once she stopped amid twirl and her eyes clouded with misery. Oh, it's not going as fast as it needs to. That was the beginning of the small chocolates from the aqua box and the thirsty consumption of the liquid in the green bottles. Some dawnings now were full of distant noises of sickness, a sound I knew all too well from having been set upon the walls of water closets before. And so, and so all the harder I worked to show my love in her reflection. I mourned her formal self. I wanted to see Cassie as she was the first day she bought me, the way I had seen her when she gazed into me, the way... The way I had seen Cassie that magic night when her fingers had touched me and quickened my silver. I did not reflect her as she was. No, because I could not bear to look at her as she was. Instead, I fleshed up her collarbone, see the outlying shadows disappeared. I swelled her shivering breasts. I, when sometimes it was difficult to restore her, I, I looked to her armoire for inspiration, and, for there were images there, Cassie, executing an arabesque, Cassie in her white rose hat, Cassie, her arms around a man whom I hoped was not damned, but suspected otherwise. The more like a stick she became, the more I brushed stroked the reflection of her body. I filled her clothes. I, I waited for her to dispose of Dan's image, but she wouldn't, which meant I restored her further, so I could impress upon her even more clearly that I, I loved her the way she had been. I was not like Dan, and yet still she did not acknowledge. Each day it was anger upon anger. She stood before me, she wept and cursed, and there was nothing I'd do to comfort her except to add more flesh upon the reflection of her bones and wait for her to see me. And then one dawning when the bedroom walls were brighter than usual because of the newly fallen snow outside the French doors, she stared at me with burning hate, contempt in her eyes. I hate you, she murmured, low, threatening. You are worthless, you are evil, you deserve nothing. How, how could she say this to me? 
All I had wanted to do was love her. All I had given her was love. All I had wanted was her love in return because Dan, the lover, was not right for her. I was the only thing she needed to love, and we would dwell in her room of the white roses forever. We were meant to be as one. It was my fate. My final home was to be with Cassie. Hmm. Mirrors. We have horror stories, we do. That there is fire in the home when we crack in the heat. That there are arguments between lovers we are accidentally struck with a candlestick, a lamp, an ashtray. That we are carelessly angered and slipped from the wall. These are terrible ways to be disfigured for certain. But there is another way, one that is disrespected for it is considered not... What's considered most selfish. That is a self-inflicted shattering. It is an extreme thing, never to be practiced except in excruciating situations. And it is serious undertaking. It is... It is a commitment one makes to the mutilation and perhaps permanent destruction of oneself, for it means that one believes nothing will be more painful than what one is watching. In that moment, I shattered myself. And hundreds of incidents, many shadows, many dawnings, many women ago returned to me. All at once, the shriek and wail of one suddenly widowed owner, the heat of a too close candle of another during something called a seance, the smell of another, another giving birth in a straw bed. Only these were inside all inside me all at once and, and overwhelming, and I expected to go momentarily blind, but I did not, and I, instead I, I watched Cassie as my surface cracked and split. In the after, she glow, glowered at me and, Wondered, I wondered what she saw, for all I could see of her through the chatter was disjointed, disconnected, dismembered, like the painting that had hung across from me in my latest owner Mary's dining room, the one she had bragged to her dinner's guests was a real Picasso. You can't do this to me any more, she thrust her hands over her ears. I won't listen to you. I won't. And Cassie fled from the room. I heard commotion from below, clashing and crashing, and yes, even breaking glass, and then she returned, and she stood before me. She took out a long silver object, a carving knife. I had seen one in Mary's dining room. It was for slicing meats, and she pressed the blade against her wrists. I think I screamed. I'm not sure. Eventually, Cassie went still, and there was no sound. No, nothing. Her vacant eyes stared into mine. She was so close to me. I could not feel any fog on, on me from her breath. I wanted to get down off the wall and shake her, make her look at me, make her see me, but I could not. All I could do was press forth a piece of my backing to let loose a shard of glass, and it fell to the carpet with a tink of thud. Many shadows passed, and then it all ended with bugs. At first there was only one in the layer of dust that had formed in, on the antique trunk at the foot of the bed. And then another bug joined him, and another, and they made paisley patterns on her nose and eyes, colliding and bouncing off one another until a teeming quilt of them thrummed over her body. And through the shatter, I watched Cassie melt away.